we're ready to get started here. Um, the board is all here. I feel like an expectant father this morning relative to the findings of this August group. Um, all of many people in this room have participated in this process um, and had uh, an opportunity for input and discussion, uh, albeit brief, um, but, but they know what they're doing. So um, and have been very impressed in the process. Um, but on behalf of the city, officially, I um, would like to express our appreciation to all of our panelists, the, the uh, Urban Land Institute, um, the ULL, ULI staff, Tom, thank you very much, and um, each of the individual advisory panel members who have contributed their time and their industry expertise to advise us in this Warm spring strategy, which I think obviously is one of the, the keys to Fremont's future and in sort of a, a blank canvas, uh, if you want to use an artistic um, analogy. Uh, we'd also like to thank city staff who have helped us get uh, where we are today. Too uh, many to mention, but I will say um, on point have been Christina, uh, Kim Marshall, and of course Kelly Klein have just done a wonderful job. This has been a very labor-intensive uh, process. Um, we have been uh, working at this for about two years, and most of you know the story. Uh, it's been successful so far, but it's a long-term story. It will take uh, quite a while. There will not be instant results, uh, but there will be a lot of sacrifice. Um, and a lot of discipline, because if we come up with this plan as the manager, I'm going to be very guarded about this in, you know, to, in doing my job and advising councils and planning commissions on out in the future, stick to the plan, don't cave in. Um, and that's what's going to be important. Um, also, most importantly, thank you to those who are attending the presentation today. We do have um, some residents uh, in, our, in the crowd, uh, business and property owners in particular, developers, brokers, media representatives, um, and staffs of uh, the regional agencies who've also, uh, who are here and who have also participated. Um, we are um, progressing from an automaking factory in an auto-oriented uh, uh, suburb to a world-class employment and innovation hub uh, anchored by rapid transit and the nation's hottest green tech uh, environment, Tesla Motors. Um, as the Model S car rolls off the line next week and the people's drive, into people's driveways, um, there is a renewed sense of optimism uh, about America's role in advanced manufacturing. And here in Fremont, we are ground zero for that. This is beyond a niche. It is our strength, and we are going to play to it. And when that market comes, as the economy heats up, I think we're poised and ready for success. Um, we are very um, pleased with the prestigious help of uh, ULI. This will be a great marketing effort in addition to uh, the expert um, advice that we get. So I'd like to now introduce Victor Karen. He's the principal of City Build Enterprise in Boston and the chair of this National Advisory Services panel. Uh, and, and we thank you, Victor, very much. Come on up. Thank you, Fred. You may applaud. Uh, <laughs> well, let's see if you have twins or not first. Mm, not a not a laughing crowd. <laughs> uh, no, seriously. Thank you very much, uh, the city and everybody, all of the stakeholders who we interviewed, and the residents who have showed up here uh, have been incredibly hospitable. Um, we couldn't have done it without that. A little bit about the Urban Land Institute. We're a not-for-profit educational and research foundation with 30,000 members worldwide. Our membership includes the full breadth of professionals involved in real estate development. Developers, architects, planners, bankers, lawyers, we're the broadest based organization of its kind. We provide an advisory services program communities that request our assistance in addressing questions that they're wrestling with about real estate development. And that's why we're here. At the request of the City of Fremont, we spent the past several days addressing questions that they've posed about the development of the area around the Warm Springs BART station, which as you all know is now under construction. Now, a little bit of a disclaimer here. Typically, 
we do not generate the kind of sketches that you see on the walls here. We only had two, three days to look at this, and it's remarkable that our designers were able to do what they did in that short amount of time. But don't get too hung up on the details. If we got a building quite not right, that's because of time. What we're trying to convey are concepts. So with that disclaimer, for each of our assignments, we assemble a panel of experts related to the questions posed. In this situation, our panel, whose members contribute their time on this assignment, includes Jack Wierzynski, Economic Development Director of the Dallas Area Rapid Transit System, Michael Lander, President of the Lander Group of Minneapolis, Minnesota, a developer, Michael Byrne, President of MJB Consulting in New York and Berkeley, a market analyst, Stephen Andepit of City Lab 7, urban design consultant out of Seattle, Washington, Clarence Ang, an urban design transit planner with Kimley Horn Associates in Florida, and uh, rounding out the Boston contingent, Stephen Gray, urban designer with Sasaki in Boston. We're kind of the Boston bookends here. We're the twins you're going to have. <laughs> in addition, from ULI Washington, we have Tom Eitler, director of our advisory services, and Basil Hallberg, senior associate for capital markets. Oh, there we are. <laughs> Takes a while for me to coordinate eye and hand. The city of Fremont has requested us to look at the following with respect to the Warm Springs study area, an 850-acre area roughly bounded by Nimitz Freeway, Grimmer Boulevard, Route 680 Freeway, and Mission Boulevard in Fremont. And you can see the study area kind of located there in relation to the other five towns that make up Fremont. The Warm Springs BART area, uh, the Warm Springs BART station, you can see located right in the middle of the study area. The questions that the city posed were, what are the best examples of jobs-focused, transit-oriented developments considering the specific characteristics of the study area? So taking stuff that is generally being done throughout the country, best practices, tailoring it to the study area. What are the public realm improvements needed to create a 21st century workplace? When you go on the site today, you think, oh my god, this is like a 17th century economy. You know, all we need to do is get some corn and plant it. There's going to be a need for public improvements to make this happen. Now that doesn't mean you're not going to get a payback on your public improvements. In fact, when you hear from some of the other panelists, you'll see that the payback here is extraordinary. If you hold the line, as Fred said, if you keep focus on the vision, you'll get an enormous payback. What is the vision of redevelopment translated through the renderings? And you'll see some renderings. What is the recommended implementation phasing so that you can get some short-term opportunities without sacrificing the long-term vision? So what we did first was we looked at best practices. Uh, these are two publications that the ULI has put together. I definitely commend uh, them to your staff to look at. But one thing that I'd like to draw your attention to, and other team members will speak in more detail as we go through the presentation, <coughs> is the potential for appropriate housing development to enhance the positioning of this 21st century business park in the marketplace. Now why is that? That's because both employees and employers show an increasing preference for locating where they can walk to work. We've all heard that story. Residential uses help enliven a site 24-7 and they provide support for the retail and food uses that office users value. We heard that from a number of employers in this business park. There's nowhere to eat unless you want, you know, a McDonald's burger. 
Excuse me? Right, exactly. We, we actually had a nice <laughs> dinner in, um, what was the name of the place? What? <laughs> yeah. So after the general use, we proceeded to the specific with a great tour and set of stakeholder interviews organized by the city. And uh, picking up on Fred, thank you, especially Kelly. Thank you, Christina. You also put together an excellent briefing book that allowed us to hit the ground running. So thank you very much. What did we learn? Your community has tremendous assets from which to build. But there are also some challenges. And the study area presents an unparalleled opportunity, if you can meet those challenges, to create a 21st century workplace that'll be the best of its kind in the entire Bay Area. Your assets. Coming from Boston, environment and climate, I mean, you know, not a problem. <laughs> Location and access. Um, right near the freeways, uh, right near, you know, a lot of good roads, you're gonna have a BART station, uh, pretty darn good, you know, in the Bay Area. Your community demographics and housing supply. Your residents speak 137 languages. That's amazing. <clears throat> They're well educated, they make above the median income, your housing supply is first class. Homes are a little expensive over here. I guess I better go back to Boston. Your schools, first class, we heard that. And that's what really attracts families into your community. And you have a current business sector strength that some of you may not really know that you have. Um, you have about as many people working here within your city boundaries as live here. That's a characteristic of a major center city hub of a metropolitan area. Not typically the characteristic of a suburban town. That's a huge strength. And you have the largest underdeveloped continuous acreage available for business park in the region. Larger than Moffett Field, larger than uh, South Bay in San Francisco. And the challenges, leveraging your outstanding environment you have the bay, you have the mountains. You can't get from one place to the other very easily. That could be leveraged to your advantage. You have a lot of roads, you have the BART station, but they don't all connect. I mean, you have two freeways here within a mile and a half of each other, or even less, and the traffic has to go on local arterial roads, clogging those roads. And it's not just the freeways, it's the bikeways. The bikeway goes and then it stops. There's some blocks with sidewalks and some without. Roads kind of stop and go, all different manner. That could be addressed. Even though you have a great housing stock, there's a certain lack of diversity in it. Now, some of that's being addressed. You don't have a whole lot of apartments for young workers. They have to go outside of Fremont, even if they want to work in Fremont. That's a challenge. Schools shouldn't be much of an issue, uh, especially if you target the housing stock to young working families, small apartments. They typically do not have kids that would overburden your schools. So your schools probably don't have too many challenges except to get the handful of them that don't perform at the highest level, up to the highest level. Transitioning from a strong 20th century business park model to a 21st century one is a challenge. You've got pretty decent business park to the south of here, but it's basically one, two stories tall, made for 20th century users. That's not the kind of space that's being demanded in places like the peninsula for the new knowledge economy. So that's a challenge. And sort of an overarching challenge, there's kind of like no there there. 
And we've got some thoughts on that. You've got some thoughts on that. That's going to take some time, but it's doable. So to talk in more detail, I'm going to ask Jack to come up here and really get into the meat of it, describe the opportunity and the vision. Thank you, Victor. Um, and I'm just going to up front, I'll apologize. I usually don't read uh, my text, but uh, in this case, there's just so darn much good information. I want to read it and not miss any of it as we go through here. Um, and Victor gave an excellent overview on leaning into the, the vision and opportunity, which I really looked at. Um, <clears throat> the Fremont Station presents the city of Fremont with its first opportunity to leverage several large parcels of vacant, underutilized land as well as um, the BART investment of over 150 acres to develop a strategically urban neighborhood. Uh, the study, the existing manufacturing, green research, and development currently existing within the 880 acre plus study area, along with the investment of the BART rail station, will act as the catalyst to further enhance the existing employment center and investment of Tesla, as well as provide for the new demographic, the uh, Gen Yers, the Millennials, the uh, Baby Boomers, uh, or those of us like me who've got a 17-year-old and I'm an aspiring empty nester. So, um, <clears throat> and, and so that's going to really uh, weigh hard, uh, heavily on decisions we make in the future on where we reside, both ends of the spectrum. As you can see here, over 4.3 million people are turning 22 through 2017. This is really the next big market. And the thing that's also influencing it is they're the now, now the connected generation. The social media is really what drives them. And uh, I mentioned my son, he's in no hurry to get a driver's license. And we're seeing that. It's really influencing a lot of the patterns we see on transit right now where the car isn't the primary uh, motive to get out. Social media is now taking the place of that, how they communicate with their friends and interact. So uh, very important as we look forward to how we accommodate this generation. As well, as I said, the baby boomers, that's the other end. We've got this dumbbell of uh, real influence here on the, on the housing market. <clears throat> Additionally, housing trends, houses, houses are getting smaller, uh, less mobility, uh, very interested in being close to transit, uh, and a mix of uses around there to really uh, take advantage of the walk and bicycle environment. And uh, again, showing uh, the, you know, the old trend of the McMansion seems to be going away. Uh, the Dallas area, we were heavily hit. I live in a neighborhood that had a lot of this going on. And it's really slowed down because of the economy and also just the uh, desires of the, the population out there to really not live in that large home but uh, consolidate things. <clears throat> so the panel has identified three basic underlying themes for the Warm Springs TOD. People and community, sense of place, and jobs and employment. And one of the things uh, Victor had mentioned earlier and we had discussed also with staff is looking at case studies, other places throughout the United States. So we drew uh, several projects from throughout the United States that are TODs, work-oriented, uh, active, vibrant places. Uh, and um, we'll uh, move forward with that. But this as a background really, I think, gets you to start, think start thinking about what do you see as appropriate within the Warm Springs area. Uh, the immediate opportunities are several. The investment in over 150 acres of property by the Union Pacific and their willingness to work with the City of Fremont to determine the highest and best use to strategically integrate their holdings into the transit environment, the anticipated future expansion of the Tesla workforce, the investment in over 30 acres north of Grimmer Road and west of the station for future mixed-use residential, as well as several other large parcels that are located around the station area positioned the property for something not seen before in uh, Fremont from what we could see. The BART investment in this large amount of property over 30 years ago, anticipating the future Warm Springs station and designing with an eye to flexibility to accommodate future TOD has assured that this property will become the focal point for investment in transit-oriented development. Additionally, the fact that the station will be the temporary end of the line station, which as uh, we've seen, in talking with uh, Val Minotti from BART and others in staff, this could be a, a, maybe a year will be the end of the line, could be up to three years. But it's a very short time, so there's a lot of opportunities involved with that on how you can be flexible within the station area. 
And given the, the context of large available parcels, existing employment centers, uh, demand for new housing and retail opportunities allows the city of Fremont to develop a vision unlike that of any other BART station in the system, allowing for both the residential and employment focused transit oriented development. The other exciting thing is the station design, which accommodates an iconic, <clears throat> iconic entrance plaza and focal point for the station area. Presents a primary focus area for the city to invest in opportunities for civic investments, such as open space, performing arts centers, educational workforce, training connected by signature pedestrian bridge, which will bring focus to the largely overlooked uh, part of Fremont and as it goes over the west side of the property on the other side of the rail track. And also, um, as we talk about the station area, one thing I want to make a note of too is having worked for a transit agency for 20 years, one of the things as my participation in this group is sort of the watchdog of no, you can't move the station and no, you can't do another bridge on it and <laughs> which hopefully Val appreciates because um, I know how our, our engineers are so receptive to new ideas once they're in design. <laughs> Um, the, uh, the art class entrance and plaza uh, will become the focal point for the first joint development phase of the project uh, on the BART property and anticipated public investment in key civic uses. The first phase should become the initial development that will bring focus to the station and the new Warm Springs transit oriented environment, focusing on the main and main intersection at Grimmer Road and Warm Springs. The initial development is suggested to occur on the east side of the, uh, of the parking area at the plaza itself with a mix of uses, commercial retail opportunities, and with residential focused on that east side as well as then maybe migrating north towards Grimmer Road as the project uh, evolves. On the west side of the station, development should transition to more mixed use employment based environment on the, particularly on the 109 acre UP property. With the, with the growth in employment opportunities and the development of the signature Warm Springs TOD, one of the things we considered as a possibility could be a potential uh, demand for hospitality, such as an anchor hotel that can provide close by location for business travelers, as well as meeting and conference space to support today's downsized work environment. Must be reiterated though that the previous investment by BART and this strategically located property as well as BART's decision to provide surface parking and not go right to a structured parking gives a lot of flexibility to accommodate a reorientation of parking and access as development plans are undertaken. So again, that flexibility to be able to, to move and adjust as development proposals come in because as I, I know from my daily work that uh, there's no developer that uh, does not have a better idea than DART staff. They all seem to have, you know, it should be there, not here. And I always talk to our engineers about, you know, the last thing we want to do is place a parking garage because we will put it exactly where a developer says, I wish you wouldn't put it there. So <clears throat> I think that's one of, the, one of the real benefits here. What we've seen is this flexibility that's been ingrained into the project. The service parking at BART station presents this opportunity for the city of Fremont and BART to be flexible in the planning of the site the initial phase of development as well as positioning the provision of civic uses and amenities which can be used to enhance access to and from the station as well as leverage private investment. Along with BART's investment in its land holdings, the early planning stages may be an opportunity for the city of Fremont to invest in key strategically placed parcels such as the triangular parcel immediately to the west of the platform which will be a touchdown point for the signature bridge and maybe and the initial development site leading into the UP property. The importance of a public investment to lead the way to create a strategically urban signature place at the Warm Springs station cannot be stressed enough. A station will not create a place on its own. A station can be the catalyst for an investment by both public and private sectors and without which it will be nothing more than a park and ride lot. So with the city of Fremont leading the way, programming the public space, and therefore energizing the daytime activity generated around the station by being the hub of employment, retail, and residential living oriented around a pedestrian friendly environment together creates that sense of place that we talk about. Introducing the unique flavor of the newly connected high tech sustainable community further enhances the Warm Springs station transit oriented environment to be one of, its, uh, one of its kind in the BART system. 
and sought out location by both employers, employees, and the new demographic of residents that I mentioned earlier. So what you're gonna hear next uh, from the rest of our team is a program to take advantage of these visions and opportunities I've identified. And you'll hear about first the market, a development program, design suggestions, an investment strategy, and an implementation approach that'll help Fremont move towards this goal for a, a future TOD employment uh, uh, oriented project. So now with that, I'd like to introduce Michael Landrieu, who's gonna discuss with us the market opportunities that we see out there. Thanks, Jack. Good morning. It's great to be here. It's been a fun week working with my colleagues and getting to know some of you in the beautiful city of Fremont. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the market uh, potential for this site. Uh, again, we are bringing sort of uh, many years of experience to this assignment, a, limit, a more limited understanding of Fremont, although we did have some good communication with some of the people active in the community here. Uh, you're going to hear some of the same themes as we move through this conversation, whether it's from the design or market or implementation perspective. All starts with the BART and the access to this site. The two freeway systems and BART create tremendous access, and that really is the foundation of, of, of a market potential. Uh, so we see that right up front. As we've said, the tremendous open land here creates great flexibility to respond to the market. And one of the things that I believe in as a developer is the ability for good framework plans, good urban plans, to build in flexibility to respond to the market. You think of a classic urban place that has a mix of uses, rather than being so fixed that it has to be one or the other. Many different uses can be folded in to a well done urban plan. And so the market will shift over the time of this project. It's gonna be a long-term project. We think that the high cost neighbors you have across the peninsula in the South Bay create an opportunity here as those markets heat up and displace folks, that that value will migrate this direction. And we've seen example after example around the country in the last 15 years in particular, the value of placemaking, creating a there there. And that as uh, Victor and Jack referred to that the market has uh, a significant part of the market, and we'd say significant, maybe 20 to 40 to 50% still a majority may be preferring a suburban pattern, but a significant number of new consumers, whether as residents or employees, seeking that, uh, that, that place. I'm gonna open with jobs. We got a clear direction from the staff. They wanted this to be a job center, and uh, we have some challenges in that department. I think our team and our plan is going to address those, but there currently really isn't uh, much of an office market in this community, in Class A in particular. Uh, we hear about fantastic rents across the peninsula, four to seven dollars a square foot, and a Fremont market that has trouble reaching a dollar a square foot. So a significant cost differential, very close to you. Uh, again, so we see those high cost neighbors perhaps creating a market in the future here. Uh, again, I think in order to attract them, we're gonna have to create a great sense of place, a place that people wanna be, a unique place in the region in order to uh, capture that. So the, maybe the primary motivation might be cost moving in the proximity, uh, but if we create a great place, we believe over time, we can interest employers in this site. It becomes an affordable option to these very expensive, high cost neighbors. We're proposing as part of our plan, and there'll be a little more information on it, an innovation center there as an icon for the creativity that exists in this community and begin to launch this as a place of innovation. We have more conversation about that. The other job uh, creator is your R tremendous R&D inventory and the, the market that's already established here. We anticipate that continuing and that you'll be able to welcome more of those users onto this site, adding jobs in that category. So uh, I am primarily a housing developer uh, and I'm gonna speak a little bit to that at this point. We see that as the place to launch this project, that the housing can come in larger amounts and help create that sense of place. As previous speakers said, the market is changing dramatically, more and more consumers seeking a walkable lifestyle. And that's really what we have to offer here. And again, those changing demographics, most of the, nationally, all of the housing demand in the future is essentially for one and two person households. Nationally, we have enough single family homes to serve the single family market in the future. And we're wildly underserved in multifamily. That's gonna vary community by community. You've been distinctly a single family community here. 
you certainly could attract other single family users to your schools and your great quality of life. But there's a segment of your community today here, as well as people that want to come here, uh, that are seeking different kind of housing types. And we think this site allows the development community to deliver a variety of new non-single family types, townhouses and condominiums, stacked flats and smaller increment buildings, some stack flats over limited retail and commercial offerings, senior housing, affordable and workforce, a sort of no shortage of market, and then some innovative types live work. And we're going to see some of the design ideas that take some commercial space that originally is purposed for flexi space or live space that might transition into more retail or commercial over time. Our economics in the market uh, suggest that we can deliver housing here at an average of 35 units to the acre. There will be some types that go, go below that, some that go above that. So we think that residential provides an opportunity to come in, fa in fairly significant quantities. The market is strong. We've heard from local developers ready to act on this site. And we think that's the DNA to create this great place. Uh, I'm going to turn things over to my colleague. Michael Byrne, who's going to talk about the retail opportunities here and really help you understand where we are with all that, because that's really one of the place-making opportunities. Michael. Thanks, Mike. Uh, good morning. I'm going to talk uh, specifically about the retail. That's my uh, singular focus as a consultant. Um, and uh, one of the things we heard loud and clear uh, is an interest here in Fremont in some sort of Main Street setting. Um, something to do, restaurants, entertainment, maybe some shops. Um, and that really uh, speaks to a basic human need, one that wasn't fulfilled for decades in this country uh, and, and in Fremont as well uh, with the rise of regional malls. Um, that said, uh, the one uh, note of caution, uh, if nothing else, is that right now, uh, looking at the city, and to be fair, I only saw some of it, <laughs> city of 215,000, hard to complete in two days, um, there doesn't seem to be much precedent for Main Street retail now. That's not to say we don't try to pursue it where it's most promising, just that uh, we don't want to uh, go too far too fast and try to throw a lot of new main streets on the market at one time. That's, that's my point about that. Um, we're aware of what you're trying to do in the downtown and on Capitol Avenue, uh, and we certainly do not want to undermine that here on this site. Uh, so we looked very closely at those plans. Um, and I'm a little nervous uh, about them, um, even with the new development and vision, the walk-in trade on Capitol Avenue is not going to be sufficient to support two blocks of retail. Um, so you need to draw off-site, draw from off-site. Um, and to do that, the traffic levels are rather low, visibility is not great, um, and you're competing for consumers and tenants with, I'm going to mispronounce this, Mowry Avenue? OK. Um, <clears throat> which has uh, very high traffic flows and will be the preference for most consumers and tenants. Uh, so I'm a little nervous uh, about, about, about what's planned for Capitol Avenue. Um, Pacific Commons obviously is trying to offer a sort of Main Street-like setting with the block. Um, and that I see as far more uh, near term. Um, uh, for a number of reasons. Um, so Main Street retail, I, you know, I, given what I said uh, to begin with, a little nervous about trying to, uh, trying to uh, deliver too much of that product too soon. It's obviously a trend which is building nationally as well as in Fremont, and so we'll get there. Uh, I just don't want to overreach. Um, the next... Uh, what we also heard is this void in upscale retail here. Um, the incomes are, uh, are very high. Uh, I live in, in Berkeley, and even I was astounded <laughs> by, the, by the household incomes here. Um, and there's been the assumption that that translates uh, to discretion, high, discre high levels of discretionary spending. Um, uh, I'm not entirely convinced of that, and I think the lack of upscale retail here now says something in its own right. Um, I know that psychographic analysis has suggested the presence of segments that, that, that typically spend quite a bit. Uh, 
Just one retail consultant's opinion, I'm not a big fan of Claritas's PRISM system. I think it's, I think it's, it lacks nuance and its distributions are often dubious. They don't really match what I see out there. So I think that deserves a little further exploration. But I think the larger point here is we don't have much upscale retail now and that's not just a matter of perceptions. It is partly and that's what we're trying to address here. But also, these retailers, when you're talking the Crate and Barrels, the Apples of the world, they know where their sales are coming from. They analyze credit card receipts, they look at e-commerce sales. If they see a large amount of sales to residents of Fremont, they will look more seriously at opening a store there. That said, Pacific Commons could tell us undoubtedly reached out to those retailers uh, when developing that, that project and, and might very well be reaching out to them again in trying to lease the block. Um, and they're still not, uh, they're still not ready, not ready yet. Um, and, and that says something. Um, I think if they do become ready, Pacific Commons, the block is, is, is the obvious first choice. Uh, so we're competing against that. Um, now, that said, I think the arrival of Whole Foods um, it can be quite instrumental. If that store does well, I think that will turn some heads. Um, so I think that could change. But so just a, a few words of, 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 of caution on, on those two fronts. Getting to the site itself, uh, given what I've said, uh, we don't see retail as the driver, and that's not news to you, you've heard that before, but we do see it as playing a critical role here, as an amenity, as an, as an essential amenity for rebranding Fremont, suggesting to new sorts of users, um, to, to n the sorts of residents, the sorts of office workers, sorts of employers that we're trying to attract, saying to them that this is a different place. And I think there's a real opportunity here for, for a couple of reasons. One, the peninsula, as appealing as it is, say, to Class A office tenants, um, it, it's, it's very much dominated by these sort of self-contained campuses. Providing all this on one site offers a real point of differentiation. Um, and not only is it a point of differentiation, but it's a necessary one because your competitors um, are working on this right now. For instance, I'm working right now in Kendall Square in Cambridge. And the biotech developers there um, have, been, uh, have, have seen the importance of creating a more active street life um, and a 24-7 environment, to use a cliche, um, in trying to attract new biotech workers. In fact, some of the biotech companies themselves um, have stated that they want ground floor retail for that very reason. Um, so I think it's necessary given the competition. Um, so what does this mean specifically, retail as amenity? Well, in this first phase, um, as the BART station opens, we see a modest amount of retail space, 5,000 square feet, um, populated main, or filled mainly with quick service food and drink and conveniences. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about coffee bar, I'm talking about a bagel shop, I'm talking about dry cleaners, talking about a wine shop. This is, these are tenants that appeal largely to commuters. Um, and we see those, the most promising locations as corner spaces, corner spaces on this warm spring square parcel. And I think I'm the first one on the team to, to reference that. Warm Spring Square, basically the name we're giving for the, re for the development of the parking lot site just to the east of the BART station, between the BART station and Warm Springs Road. Right. So we're seeing, we're seeing 5,000 square feet of, of retail space on the corners of the new development um, um, envisioned there. In addition, the mid-block space, which is typically harder to lease, um, that should be retained as what we call flex space, which means in, in the near term, it can be occupied by active non-retail uses, but in the long term, it, it has been designed uh, uh, so that it can be converted to retail space as circumstances warrant. Um, so phase two, okay, phase two, we're getting growing density of residents uh, and office workers, that's in Berkeley. Uh, they're opening another one in downtown Oakland. Uh, it's, 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 it's pretty wild. <laughs> Um, urban turban, um, but uh, growing worker resident density on the west side of the station. Um, 
And we're seeing that as, as making possible a whole new set of retail tenants. Fast casual food purveyors like Urban Turban, even maybe a restaurant bar hybrid, a small 1,000 square foot micro grocery. Um, and we see that those tenants as first filling those mid block spaces on Warm Springs Square, the 15,000 square feet we reserved for that. And then once those spaces are filled and those businesses stabilize, moving west of the BART station. All right? um, and, and, and designers will get into a little more of what we're envisioning there. Um, now an important point to mention about phase two, the resident worker density is still growing. Um, it's, it, it, and, and, and you know, that's gonna take some time. Plus the creation of a place that we've been talking about, um, that will take some time. In this kind of transitional phase, um, these tenants might need some help. Uh, developers might need to be a little more generous, for instance, with, 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 lo with lower rents, maybe build out assistance. Um, and furthermore, uh, we do feel that at this point, given that there's still a limited number of on-site residents and workers, that we need to tap off-site demand as well. And that implies a few things. One, it implies visibility from uh, major roads like, well, in this case, major roads like Grimmer Boulevard, Fremont Boulevard, um, might also require s at least side parking. Um, and it might necessitate crossover concepts. These are kinds of restaurants, for instance. They appeal to who we're trying to attract to, these, to this new demographic we're targeting. Uh, but at the same time, it also, uh, it also appeals to existing Fremont residents. Um, so it's gotta be something that kind of captures both of those markets. Because again, we don't have enough on site yet um, uh, for it to be self-sufficient. Okay, at this, in this phase two, the other thing that needs to be happening is these, are these placemaking efforts. Um, further into the site in this Warm Springs Plaza that you're going to be hearing about. Uh, and that can, that can take advantage uh, of non-traditional retail. And that's one of the most exciting parts of my field right now. The food trucks, the temporary pop-up stores. Um, this is a new one, which Stephen might tell you about after me, something called cargo texture. That's actually a Starbucks coffee. <laughs> um, uh, so non-traditional retail that can help to create the sense place along with all of the other efforts uh, in that regard that do not relate specifically to retail. Um, and while, these, while all this is all happening, again, flex space elsewhere on the ground floor so that we can convert it to retail use later on. Finally, last slide, phase three. Now we're approaching full build out. We really have a critical mass on site of residents and workers we have a sense of place. Uh, here's where things really get exciting. The retail can start to spread into the development. Warm Springs Plaza is this plaza that is envisioned just on the west side of the BART station, and you'll hear about that some more. Um, Innovation Way is the corridor that we are um, proposing through the west side development, connecting ultimately to Fremont Boulevard. Um, we, can, we can see retail spreading uh, in that direction. Uh, and without on-site parking, right? Obviously the garages, um, but not parking specifically tied to the individual retailer. Um, uh, and that's when it gets truly urban. In total, we're, th we're seeing a potential at full build out, which is some time from now, uh, of 50,000 square feet of retail space west of the station, in addition to the 20,000 east of the station. 70,000 square feet in total. Again. Do not want to compete with the block. We do envision some restaurants and bars here, but frankly, the block's much better, or will be much better positioned, the block and Pacific Commons. It's larger, it's got a multiplex anchor, um, so we do not want to try to go head to head. But we more see this again as a critical amenity in rebranding uh, the site in Fremont more generally, and in luring this kind of these these uh, these newer newer residents and employers. Um, so now I'm going to give way to Stephen, and he's. Is this? Is that yours? Okay. 
Thank you. <clears throat> Just as um, Michael gave you the context uh, for uh, retail possibilities for the site. I'm going to spend just a few minutes for the design context, and then we're going to get into the specific proposals that my colleagues are going to walk through. Um, so in three respects, I'm going to talk about design context for the site. One is local, second is regional briefly, and then third is really talking about new models for neighborhood design. Um, so we, we all know that Fremont has grown up as a family of towns, uh, and our charge is really to help nurture uh, this site become the next town. Um, and significantly, uh, it's, it's worth noting that um, relative to the size and location of the other historic towns uh, in Fremont, that Warm Springs is where two of the major pieces of infrastructure in the city, 680 and 880, are literally the bookends for the site. None of the other locations are like that. Um, however, the accessibility that makes this site special isn't so much the interchanges that are nearby, but it's actually the next generation of infrastructure, and that's the BART station. So that's really important to think about what in differentiation uh, in terms of how, it's how Warren Springs is situated in Fremont. Uh, and then similarly, um, in a regional context, um, this is a great slide that we got from city staff. Uh, how much the Warm Springs study area compares to other major regional attractors for um, redevelopment and, and job-focused um, uh, centers. So uh, Warm Springs is, doesn't have the same context as Mission Bay at, at Moffett Field, but it's also um, a potentially a much bigger player um, in, in that arena. So then the third thing I want to talk about briefly, just so we can keep going and get into the design drawings themselves, um, is really to think about sustainability and helping uh, give a new identity as an innovation neighborhood. So this really is thinking about um, a new model for neighborhood design. We've talked about, well, this is, we're really not talking about a business, traditional business park environment. We're not talking about actually a conventional transit-oriented development site that's residential focused. Really, the, the possibilities for sustainability can really pick up on the, um, the opportunity presented by BART um, and the leadership of the city and as part of branding the, the creative energy and the creative possibilities um, that we see in the future at Warm Springs. So first, I'm going to talk about three briefly uh, parts about that. So an employment-focused transit community is a huge opportunity in terms of sustainability and really showing leadership. Uh, and that doesn't, that doesn't mean just that there's a BART station and a part of a, a billion dollar um, infrastructure extension. What it means really most importantly for our work and what we see the city doing and the partners in the room uh, is really to uh, take advantage of BART and match that with very aggressive parking management and transportation demand management. Um, this is a sustainability strategy because if done right in terms of um, providing price signals, uh, information, um, joint parking arrangements, understanding real needs and not just working from codes that come from outdated um, standards that um, really these can, these can be actually very powerful ways to actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions and reduce vehicle miles traveled, which are SB 375 and general plan uh, priorities. So really, we can really walk the talk in that respect. And that means matching the transit investment with the associated parking management, because that has everything to do with um, how everything works on the site and, the, frankly, the character of the place that gets created here. Uh, related to that, um, is about last mile connectivity. And um, I don't have a diagram up here, but if you, if you look at, at those, those ten, uh, 10 principles in the case studies of most um, TOD examples, um, we talk about a five minute walk. Well, a considerable part of this study area is beyond a five minute walk, and it's not a very hospitable place at this point. So the last mile, a couple strategies I'll just point out in our full report, we'll get into more detail on this, but for the last mile, um, it's really important that we create an excellent network of walking and cycling um, pathways, connections, places that are comfortable to be if you're not driving or waiting in an air-conditioned vehicle for light to change. So that's really that's a, a big part of the last mile. It's what happens between the BART station and your destination, or if when you're leaving work that you have a convenient way if it's your late shift, um, you're not going to necessarily walk 15 minutes uh, in the dark, um, or if it's raining, um, or if you've, you've got to carry work home or whatever else you're doing. Uh, that last mile relationship also includes setting up um, I, what I think is a tremendous opportunity here, a, a green fleet shuttle. Um, Emory go round is, is one opportunity, but hello, 
this is the home of Tesla and electric vehicles and a fleet of um, working with that, those technologies can really walk the talk in terms of making connectivity. The most promising part of that really uh, to pilot here, I believe, is stuff that's being looked at somewhat by Tesla but by others, and that is actually using electric vehicles as part of the electrical infrastructure. That's called vehicle to grid, and it's a very exciting opportunity. And if ever there were a place in North America uh, to work on that and to be partners, um, this is that place. Finally, the thing I'll talk about um, is about high-performance buildings and putting that in context with uh, lead for neighborhood development. So we know about green building standards, we know about new energy codes for buildings, but really neighborhood infrastructure and a neighborhood that's high performing is more than just um, terrific examples. And the fact that Delta is going to do lead platinum as a building or maybe net zero as a building is terrific. Um, but putting all those things together in the aggregate and thinking about infrastructure and also as a uh, differentiator is, is really significant. So uh, to our recommendation looks seriously at lead ND, lead for neighborhood development, more than for green buildings. We, yes, we have great examples, uh, individual um, developers um, and, the, and the city's efforts you know, to really walk the talk. Uh, but there's more that can be done there, uh, particularly looking at uh, incentivizing uh, what happens with utility impact fees and credits for not just good behavior, but exemplary design and um, working in terms of managing water use, uh, indoor air quality, things that you've heard about, but, um, but as, a, as a collective entity. And then the, the last thing that I'll say before, and we're going to start talking about um, design proposals in particular, is thinking about as infrastructure is required here, that it's of lowest possible impact, and it's also respect to the fact that we're very close to sea level. And in a long-term vision, we're going to have to deal with sea level rise. And what that means in terms of outfalls, outfalls in pipes and storage and that sort of thing um, is significant. So the more we can do to reduce the upstream impacts and be prepared and be flexible um, is, is a serious undertaking. But it's something that uh, we think is a tremendous opportunity here uh, that can be taken advantage of. So I'm going to turn it over to Clarence, and we're going to get into the drawings. Thank you. Um, as you heard today, I mean, one of the greatest opportunities that we have um, is overall accessibility. I mean, as you sort of saw in some of the drawings, that uh, this site is really at the confluence of 880, 680, Mission, um, and also we have BART running through here. So that is one of the strongest elements that we have. Um, so the question really is, the million dollar question, or in your case, probably a billion or trillion dollar question, <laughs> is what will uh, South Fremont become? Uh, to that, so I have to think back and, and look at what Fremont is today. In the yellow is, Fremont's known for its residential areas. Also, it's, it's workplace and manufacturing off of 880. Oftentimes, people think of those elements maybe separately. You either know it as a bedroom community, or you're maybe known as, as an employment place, but really not the two together. I think what you have here is an opportunity to change that dynamic. It's not about raising the family, but it's also about being able to work. And the kids who are now growing up and want to leave this area, where they find themselves. Uh, and sort of the demographics that you sort of described earlier. So with BART and the, uh, and the BART extension, um, that's a great opportunity. Because now you're not only connected to all the employment destinations of the peninsula, but also the employment destinations in the future in San Jose and vice versa. So really, this is not only a, a local um, solution, but it's also a regional solution. And I think that the opportunity here is looking at this site not only being a good site, but probably an even better site with all this infrastructure coming in. Um, and I think at this point in time, we have to sort of think, well, how are we going to address these local and regional needs? How are we going to serve the region? Um, and it's not only about uh, the next 10 years. Downtown, downtown initiatives, probably looking at the next 10, 20 years. This is probably the next 10, 20, 30, 40 plus years. So really thinking of this as, as, as a transformative uh, element. Um, we've obviously used a, a lot of the 10 principles in this process. I'll, I'll touch on a few of them a little later. But what, first, I wanted to sort of jump in and, and say, we've heard a lot of the conversation. You know, is it going to be jobs here? Or is it going to be housing? Well, I'm going to put out there, it's not an either-or proposition. 
It's an and proposition. This site is, um, again, with an earlier diagram of showing the towns, you could probably fit all the towns, villages, and uh, shopping areas in this area. So again, that's sort of overall scale. And this really has to be uh, a people place and an economic space all together. Um, it is where you're going to work, live, play, innovate, create, all the things together in, in, in this one space. Um, to give you sort of a, an idea of sort of context from the BART station, it's probably about a third of a mile, if not a little bit more, uh, to Fremont Boulevard. That's probably about a 25 minute walk, easily. Um, from a transit perspective, again, sort of scale, uh, with about a two mile length, in most places you could probably fit two stations in there. In a downtown you probably fit four stations in there. That's sort of the overall scale uh, to which we're, we're talking. So when we start talking about uh, what is the overall character, I don't want us to get stuck initially talking, having, using nouns, housing, office, retail. Let's think and, and talk and put some adjectives out there. Inclusive. Inclusive, what that provides is young and old. Where can they live? Where can they work? Where can they find themselves and gather and congregate? You know, we've heard a lot where oftentimes the young, you know, 20 some odd is living in the peninsula downtown, maybe driving out to San Jose or down the peninsula to work. You know, they spend ha half, most of their time at work, so is there a spot here for them where they can do that, but on the weekends, using BART, head downtown. So those are the opportunities that we look at. It'll also be a safe place. I mean, what we heard and saw in, in terms of the overall um, uh, resident survey, everybody thinks it's a safe place. I don't see, see that changing because your overall composition remains the same, but you're providing opportunities. Um, it has to be creative. Again, some creative spaces. The other word, uh, innovate. Innovative. We have to leverage the partners. We have the Tesla. We have um, a lot of different employers and partners in here. How can we work together to really sort of form and, and guide this area? Connected. We talked about earlier um, that has a lot of accessibility, but as we're starting to look at this map, think about these, these, these regional connections, but realize they also serve as barriers. Um, 880, 680, it's not easy to get across, and the only few spots create congestion. Likewise, with the extension of BART and Union Pacific Railway being there, getting across and through the site is not easy. You're limited by, by the access. So those are, that's an important uh, aspect. The other sort of uh, adjective I'll put out there is flexible. As we've heard described earlier, this is a large site. And we're not, at this scale and with the limited time we have, we haven't designed and defined every single block because we can't. We can't pre predict the future. But what, we, what we've pr uh, proposed is an overall framework and structure that can allow uh, everything to happen here. And I think that the other thing I, I'll say is important, we have to rethink what workplace is and an urban village or an urban center, urban town for you all means. Um, it's not your, your father's grandfather's industrial uh, workplace. You know, we have Tesla, we have all this uh, clean tech here, and we don't know where it's going to go in the next 20, 30 years. So we have to think of this place a little bit more uh, creatively. It's neither your grandmother's or mother's, uh, you know, suburban cul-de-sac. You know, urban living, being able to provide for that is, is really going to be important. Yes, you know, Ozzy and Harriet might still live around, but along with their, you know, 100,000 of their closest Asian and other ethnic friends. <laughs> so it's, it's really about being inclusive and thinking about a place for everybody. Um, let me touch upon a, a few of the overall um, uh, principles. Again, we're sort of defining an overall vision. Um, it's important to make sure that we have the right mix. Again, with the overall scale, again, now using some of those nouns. Workplace. With just the area in the north, north of where the Tesla plant is, we could probably fit about two to three million square feet of stuff, non-residential. That translates to about 10 to 15,000 people. That's important because if you start thinking about housing, again, there's this, you know, I, we've heard this, you know, we don't want necessarily, you know, housing or we're not sure, is it, we want more workplace. You can fit both because with the limited area and we've defined using innovation way as a, a, essentially a framework 
that defines a residential area, that also provides transitions between the residential and the more uh, heavier uh, industrial workplaces, you're starting to create this, this, this texture in that site is, which is not currently there. And yes, it is hard to think about this right now looking at the site. But again, think ahead 20, 30 years and how that might be. So housing with this limited area, uh, again, penciling out maybe three to 4,000 residents. So one of the things that, that we saw, which was uh, interesting with your previous studies, it was hard to determine whether or not there was an uh, alternative one, two, or three. All of them worked for this very reason. You could fit everything, so it depends on how, how you move forward. And what that does is that it helps support what Michael was describing earlier, retail. Retail comes with people. You can't just drop down retail and hope it's going to work. You have to sort of build upon that as you move forward. Um, and so um, then the other thing I wanted to touch upon right now is um, creating great places. Because that's what people are, are really coming here for. It's not for the, the, the streets, the roads, the, the BART station. They're coming for great spaces, great places. So we have to create a there there. Um, and as we've heard in the description, around the BART station is the great opportunity. Because it provides that connectivity. It has that accessibility with Warm Springs, Grimmer Road. And that's where we'll start. But we have to think ahead and to make sure that around the, the station, on both sides of the station, that they're equal, that they're connected. So it's not the wrong side of the tracks. It's both sides of the tracks. Um, we have to think about civic spaces and plazas. And Stephen uh, is going to show you a little bit more and, and talk about that in, in, in a few moments. We have to talk about sort of bridges, um, uh, you know, be able to connect both sides of, of the spaces, making sure that along the, this, this, this road and defining the open spaces in your public realm, there are great buildings. They're well designed, and it, it really is, is encouraging uh, for the overall space. Um, and lastly, I think that we really also have to make sure that we're providing good local access. It's a large area, and be able to navigate through this area and become the real local, that local framework has to be there. So again, as described earlier, uh, whether it be the, electronic, the electric vehicle, the bicycles, pedestrians, um, local shuttles, tying to BART, that whole local feeder system really needs to be there. Um, and with that, I'm going to let uh, Stephen uh, get into a little bit of the design uh, concepts in more detail. Thanks. Good morning. So we, we, uh, what you, a lot of what you've been hearing so far is probably um, the same thing in a, from a different, slightly different perspective over and over. And I think that really reflects our experience and our interaction with you so far. And we interviewed you know, five panels, a number of people from the city, developers, landowners, um, a lot of you know, people who are really invested uh, in this site and this, this development. Um, and we heard consistently sort of the same things. Um, the overall challenges of, of Fremont is that there's no address, there's no identifiable place to meet up. There's no, you know, let's go to the, you know, and meet up for dinner or go and have a picnic or uh, something like that. There's no civic center or civic plaza. Right now you are looking at um, moving your city hall and sort of making a, a strong connection to your existing BART station. Um, and that those kinds of moves, those sort of axial relationships, and then maybe even looking into the medical area and a, and a medical district plan in the future are the types of things that are the right moves that you're doing now. Um, but what can you do with this side? What's the potential that you have at this side as well? Um, the, the, so the history of, of, of this place, as I understand, is, is the sort of the joining of five towns. Um, and you just celebrated 50 years of incorporation, I think, a few years ago. Um, and in the joining, you settled a new town center, a new downtown. Um, and you did it in a cauliflower patch, as I understand. I would say we have a lot more opportunity here than you did in the cauliflower patch. But if you look at where you've come from then to 50 years later, it's really incredible. So if you look, again, 50 years ahead, I think try to have that visionary outlook and don't you know, get so stuck on how much does this cost and how much is this you know, getting back and what is this use. The, the, the idea here is flexibility over time and, and a long range vision. Um, 
Some of the challenges, though, of this particular site are a lack of connectivity between the east and west. Um, you've got the, the track, which is, is your biggest asset and your biggest liability in terms of connectivity, um, and a, a real lack of, of an identity. And so the opportunities, though, are that you're basically right in the middle of the connection between San Francisco, San Jose, and Santa Clara, Oakley. You're dead center, and you've already got an employment base that's strong and growing. Um, you've got the BART station, which gives you even more connectivity to these places. So it's not just that you're proximally central to it, but you're actually directly connected to it. Um, and then large contiguous land area, and an opportunity to really be strategically urban in a way that you can achieve sort of quick wins in a much uh, faster and, and less um, less hairy way that you'll, you'll be going through the process in your downtown plan. So that's, that's, downtown is also a long range view, but this is an opportunity to really sort of make some bold moves. What we heard, again, primarily this is a place for jobs. This is a place where you want employment to continue to be strong and to grow and grow and grow. Um, and that this, the BART extension really offers an opportunity for this to be a hub for jobs, not a bedroom community where everyone lives here, gets on the BART in the morning and goes where they're going to go work. Some of that, but just as much people coming to Fremont as a place, a destination for employment. Um, civic armature. So the, 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 the need to sort of set the stage for, for the, the city and some, some forward thinking developers to really set the stage for the, the quality and the, the vision for this place um, with, with key sort of civic buildings or uses, uh, innovation hub, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, um, and stronger connectivity between the east and west. Um, and then flexibility is key because you don't know what the market's going to be. Um, you're discovering what the market is now. Um, and you've got seemingly endless amounts of space here. So you, can't, you don't want to set, set up a strong grid and say, this goes here and that goes there, because that's going to fail if, if, the, if the measure is, did you achieve that plan? So it's really about setting up a strong framework to build off of and to be flexible with. So just, just to orient you a little bit, um, I've sort of rotated the view. Uh, north is to the left, and east is up, and the BART station is coming in right here. You have um, old Warm Springs Road here and Warm Springs Boulevard here, uh, Grimmer, and then here you have Fremont, and here you, so you can sort of see those marked, and the new BART station coming in. And this is just a sort of a sketch of, of a strong framework, but I want to go through and describe a little bit about what that means. Um, so here you've got the BART station plan, it's coming in, um, and there already is, within the design and engineering of this station, um, the thought of crossing the tracks to the other side and having a sort of a platform that goes down and introduces a connection to um, the west side of the site. Um, and this is something that really shouldn't be skimped on. I mean, this is, this is your primary connection to that entire development area. Um, and it shouldn't be you know, some small, um, indistinguishable escalator or stair. It, it really needs to be as powerful as the BART station design is on the other side. Um, and then we really see this, this north-south connection, um, which brings you down old Warm Springs Road, as an opportunity to build on the past. I mean, that's the one diagonal through the site that connects both east and west and um, crosses from north to south. Um, and it's an, it's an opportunity, you know, you have the, the new Warm Springs Boulevard, which is really a way to move traffic, cars, and, and some bikes through. But this offers you an opportunity to have a more pedestrian experience through the site as you're moving north to south and across the site east to west. Um, and really, the opportunity to introduce an iconic uh, emblem of the innovative spirit of this, of this area that would be visible from both the highways, which are which are technically very close, but visibly um, not so connected to the site. So offering a sort of a, a welcome mat from a distance. And here's a couple more examples of what iconic bridges um, could look like. It's, it's really, the style is not important. It's just that it is uh, well engineered, well thought out, well designed, and g provides an image for whatever it is that, that you feel that you want to move forward with. Um, so setting the stage. So 
after sort of introducing this, arm, this sort of civic armature in terms of the infrastructure, then really setting some programmatic standards um, and, and architectural standards. And so choosing sort of strategic points to have an innovation hub. Now this is Boston Innovation Center, which um, just broke ground and is uh, expected to be completed in the fall. Um, this is about 12 to 15,000 uh, square feet. It is meant to be a flexible and um, public space. Um, and the, the, what this is, is that Boston is in, is in the process of rebranding the Seaport District as the innovation zone. Um, and in order to do that, uh, you need to sort of have some innovators and some innovative places. Um, and it is essentially what you have now, a lot of parking lots and some key sort of employers and innovators. Um, so what they did was they, they sort of put uh, an innovation district overlay over the seaport, um, which al allows them to, to raise monies or focus monies um, to uh, sort of strategically public pur purpose projects, but in this case, um, innovative, innovation-centered projects. Um, and so essentially anyone who wants to develop within that overlay has to either include a portion of their program as innovative and sort of more public space, or they throw money into a pot which goes towards projects like this, which is a place for people to come together, have conferences, presentations, exchange ideas, have resources if they're small businesses trying to get on, uh, on, on the upper leg. Um, and so this is really um, an example of something that you could do to sort of set the stage uh, for innovation. Um, and then, you know, to begin to define, you know, the, the, the square and the plaza and this innovation way, which you've heard some, some about earlier in the, in the conversation. Um, but when doing that, you want to make sure that you have a high quality public realm. Um, you want to make sure that the, the projects that happen around these spaces first set the stage and set the tone for what you want. If you build something and you set that image, you're going to get more, a little bit more of that before something else changes. So set, the, set, set a strong stage. Um, and here are just a few images of you know, both temporary use, which, which attracts a, a, a diverse demographic, and sort of these high quality um, uses and activities <laughs> such as this. Um, <laughs> so I, I want to now sort of just step through these three very quickly, and in the interest of time, I'll, I'll go faster. These images are on the wall. Um, but this is a view of the, of the Warm Springs Square, a view west from Warm Springs Boulevard. So this is the station view that all of you have become familiar with um, that's coming soon. Um, and I just wanted to note, so here's the station, it's looking this way, um, that this doesn't change the design of the station at all, of course, because it's, it's coming right now. Um, and it doesn't really even change the design of, of the layout around the station. It just introduces some higher and better uses than parking. Um, and so, and it begins to frame a sort of a, an axial relationship with this station um, with a, a, a more, um, a younger and a more diverse uh, neighborhood of people, but then introducing that 5,000 and potentially 15 and 20,000 square foot of retail along the edges, um, and it really activates that space. The next view is, is a cross, uh, a view um, east from Innovation Way, and you can see the, the mountains behind. And this is really where you set the stage for the future. This is where you want to have your, your innovation hubs over, over here and over here, um, some sort of civic uses with activities, um, galleries, flex spaces, um, in the very, very long term, hopefully not as long, but you know, maybe a hotel or some sort of a conference center here. Um, and just a place for people who not only work there, but who live there to gather, um, exchange ideas, and have a place to meet. And then sort of lastly is, is that final connection over to Fremont Boulevard, which links to the rest of the, the sort of the commercial system um, that Fremont has already established um, as a sort of a gateway, looking down all the way down towards the plaza and the station beyond and then the mountains beyond, and just marking that as a sort of the innovation way and the entrance into this. So again, jobs is, is important, 
but you need to have a place for people to understand where they are and to go when they're working and when they're living there. And so it's about strategic armature. Um, it's about um, fl flexibility over time, but a very strong framework. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Michael Lander. He's gonna talk a little bit about phasing and implementation. I've got some pretty creative colleagues. I'm going to bring it down to the ground a little bit uh, on the economic and sort of hardcore development side just to reduce some initial thinking just to, to quantify some of this stuff. Again, as our previous speakers have said, there's uh, the beauty of this kind of approach is the flexibility. So again, we, we took a snapshot here to, to bring it to the ground with economics, but again, this is just one of the areas that's going to evolve. Um, we looked at the study area, we took out a couple of the key parcels, Tesla, and uh, added up that we bought, have about 285 acres uh, that we're looking at here. Uh, the yellow at the top and, and the much lighter yellow to the right there, my pen ran out of ink, um, program is primarily residential, clearly always mixed use, but primarily residential, so you could see some small office folding in there, or hotels, other uses, and certainly some of the retail offerings. The blue, the dark blue, is, is really the office and mixed-use district again, including that triangular parcel that we're recommending that the look to acquire. And then down in the southern portion of the site, uh, below that, uh, more R&D space and two large uh, spots there to continue uh, offerings for that market, and then one east of Warm Springs Road. Um, so really kind of a mix. Uh, when you look at that program on paper, uh, it turns out to be 110 acres of residential, 110 acres of R&D, and about 65 acres of office and mixed use. If we build that residential of an average 35 dwelling units to the acre, that yields 3,850 units of housing. Um, that would include 20% of those units as affordable housing to workforce housing. Uh, have the 70,000 square feet of retail at build out there that Michael talked about. The office at 65 acres with a 0.5 FAR, which is, uh, again, twice what the R&D is building at, but still fairly modest relative to real urban places. Over time, we may see more density than that. But that yields 1,400,000 square feet that's very aspirational at this point. We wouldn't want to give that assignment to the brokers today. Let us get, <laughs> let us get, let us get working on the, on the place making and we'll we get back to that. But again, we really believe that this can be the kind of place that attracts people to work here, absolutely. And the R&D, the inertia is there. So the, uh, the strategic uh, investments that need to be made that have been referred to here to make connections and so forth, the BART station, of course, is the anchor, is already funded. Uh, but as we move into the first phases of the project, um, we have really high quality public spaces and streetscapes, great, creating that great place, really setting the bar high in the first phase of development the iconic bridge and plaza that uh, Stephen just showed, and acquiring the, the triangle, your piece of land, and building an innovation center. So those are a couple of very aggressive positions we're, we're, we're suggesting be looked at. Farther down the road, complete streets throughout the area, uh, adjustments and pedestrian bridges across the freeway uh, to get from here, for example, into the, the main part of the site. That totals about $55 million of investment uh, of course, we're rounding here in the short assignment, but it begins to talk about the costs of creating these places. One of the costs in there at $14 million is replacing the parking that BART has at the front of the station you saw in that early image as we uh, mine that land for development. Um, acquiring the triangle parcel of land, I put $30 a square foot, uh, $15 million there, the pedestrian bid $12 million. Again, these costs could go up or down a bit, of course, as we look at the the project unfolding, uh, the timing of when they go in is critical, of course, relative to revenues. Uh, but we want to juxtapose that to the kind of economic benefits that come from a project like this. Starting with total jobs, using uh, one worker per 150 square feet in office, and those numbers are shrinking in the market as we see office users put more employees per square foot, R&D at 300 uh, square feet per employee, about you know 13,000 jobs. We said 10 to 15, probably better to work with that bracket, but significant employment in this area. We looked at the housing units earlier, and then using $200 a square foot for office and $200,000 a unit for housing, maybe modest numbers again over time, those will change, but a billion two hundred and ninety thousand dollars of new development. So you see the significant economic engine through the build-out over time 
That translates to taxes of almost $13 million a year. State income taxes from the new households there, which we have both, uh, we, we put it at $80,000 a year. Your current household, average household incomes, well over 100,000 in the community. Smaller households, smaller incomes. And then the affordable households, smaller incomes, yet still generating $30 million a year in state income taxes in a state that needs it. Um, One-time impact fees, uh, we use $30,000 a unit, taking advantage of or suggesting that there be an incentive here at 50% of the typical rate of $60,000 a unit, and that raises $115 million. So we didn't really connect the dots in terms of exactly the timing of these flows or which tools might be used to help finance that, but when you juxtapose the $55 million of cost against these kind of benefits, it becomes a fairly small amount. $55 million against a billion two is 5%. So you see the relative investment it might be much higher percentage in the early stages. Many of our public-private deals, we see 10, 15, 20 percent investment by the public sector early, whittling back down to nothing. So, and then the kind of non-cash or non-calculatable uh, benefits of the branding. We think this community will help re-image Fremont in the larger Bay Area. Have you been to Fremont lately? The rethink Fremont. Uh, thinking. The new parks and open spaces, connections that get built into this plan, again, are amenities for your community uh, that really add value to the whole community. I um, wanted to talk just briefly about one of our questions was, well, where do you start all of this? And I think you start with what the market's bringing you. There's interest in housing here, as we talked about, that creates an opportunity to begin this placemaking. Uh, we're looking at uh, a drawing, an engineering drawing here of the BART station. You saw the image earlier. It's the BART station, beautiful glass entry element and then a whole lot of surface parking. So we think that this is the place to start, that when you come and go out of that bark station, you create that first place that people go, wow, this is different than what we've seen. It could be a very small area, but if you're in one spot looking around and feeling like the place has been delivered, that will set the stage for subsequent development. So today, really no sense of place here at all in 700 surface parking spaces. Um, Again, throughout the development, you'll have surface parking here. We'll see uh, slow moves to move away from surface to structured parking and possibly even infilling some of those structures with some more commercial uses. So again, this flexibility, this evolution over time is what this kind of development is about. So this is a very diagrammatic uh, suggestion of the first phase. You see the circle there in the drawing is the art glass uh, structure to the east of the BART station. Uh, the uh, Warm Springs Plaza, excuse me, the Warm Springs Square to the east. Again, creating this outdoor room shaped and formed by the buildings. We saw a number of images that create the kind of character in that area. Uh, in terms of yield, that takes about 400 dwelling units, built at four stories there to create that outdoor room. Uh, 5,000 square feet of retail, plus some flex space in the ground floor, we'll probably build some of those spaces to allow that retail to expand. And again, really surface parking to the north and south in that first phase. You see in the lower right the bus turnaround that comes and delivers folks to the station. So we think one of those, these great outdoor rooms, these great places could happen right away, and everybody that comes and, comes and goes on that BART station sees the new Fremont, the new place that we've created here. So we think that that would help stimulate, convey this idea on the ground, give it a place for folks to come initially into this community and enjoy these new spaces in those little uh, diagrams, those corners that Michael was talking about, perhaps activating that, that one place coming off the station with some of those early uses. A little image that of, a, of a square or a green. Stephen's beautiful drawing there, again, of how that, that existing art glass entry element uh, is framed by new buildings in the square, creating, again, that outdoor room. We were also asked to talk about how, how do you go about getting this stuff done. We recognize that it's a long-term project. It's going to be multi-years, many, many, many decisions over the long term. We also are strapped with the lack of redevelopment tools in California in this last couple of years, so we're needing to come up with new ways to go about doing this stuff, new approaches. ULI has shown some great leadership in that area. Uh, and this kind of a project requires a big vision, and then it requires a vision keeper to really to, to hold to that vision over time. There was comments earlier of, of sticking with the plan, uh, and, and I'm going to comment on that. We create a great framework plan, the work you've done so far, hopefully the contributions we make today will be the basis for taking this to the next level of creating a framework plan. And it's important as a developer to distinguish between framework, which is principles and guidelines, as opposed to master plan, you have to do this in this spot, this tall, this setback. 
That doesn't work. We're talking about principles that guide this kind of development to be flexible. Uh, there'll be a whole series of individual projects over the next 5 and 10 and 15 years. There needs to be somebody being sure that that quilt patch fits the overall quilt that we're making here. So we're suggesting that, a, uh, that the community form and fund a private-public partnership, PPP, in the business to serve as the master developer, to be the vision keeper over time there. And we suggest that be led by an experienced uh, private real estate developer, somebody that's been in the business, that's done this kind of work, uh, and to facilitate market-driven projects. Um, and that really means to understand how to fold that into these goals, access public financing tools, and just market, market, market the project to create this new place. One of the most significant challenges for that PPP, that master developer, is to know when to hold them and when to fold them, when to stick to the plan and when to adjust the plan. That's really a sophisticated role and really critical to long-term success. If you give up and, and deviate from the plan inappropriately, it's very difficult for you. If you hold too tight and aren't willing to adjust to the market, you don't get anywhere either. So it's a really, really important role. And again, ULI provides all kinds of information, history. This has been done around the country very successfully when you have these big long-term projects. Some of the examples we showed did have these public-private partnership master developed leaders. We think you should take a close look at that. So I'm going to turn the uh, mic back to Victor to wrap up. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Not only do we have talented designers on the team, but the entire team is incredibly talented. I think you'd agree. So I want to make a couple of final thoughts, and then we'll open it up for questions and answers. And the first thought, in addition to thanking you all, is another overarching asset in your community. And that is its civic-minded citizenry. It really shows through in the thoughtful approach your elected and appointed officials have taken with respect to the study area so far. And really the challenge is to basically hold them here, not to fold. You're not bluffing with this site. You've got four of a kind, four aces. As Stephen said, there are important design development moves that absolutely need to be made. And in other cases, there can be flexibility. The public sector needs to put some money in the pot, needs to raise the stakes a little bit, maybe. But the payback is humongous. And that's a technical term, by the way, that we developers <laughs> use. Otherwise, the future is actually kind of bleak. Um, the entire area could easily go to single family residential. I mean, that's a no brainer. You know, making some money for some developers like myself, not a bad thing. Uh, but certainly not providing the long term jobs benefit that is so much in the best interest of your community. So, in conclusion, we feel there are ways to address the challenges in creating a sixth town center, something that will add to the five that initially came together to form Fremont in 1956. We feel there is a way to create a sense of place, a center that provides a gathering place for not only current residents of Fremont, but new residents and workers too, a center that ties into the region that ties into the existing vibrancy that you have and not just provide you with more of the same. A center that does not duplicate nor compete with the existing character uses in the other five centers. And a way to get to that vision. So, I know you've been doing this already, but please continue to think about Warm Springs Center as Fremont and the entire Bay Area's preeminent 21st century transit-oriented work environment. Thank you again very kindly, and uh, I'll open it up for questions and answers. Yes, ma'am. That's what we want.
Day we'll come back. I don't know. <laughs> the weather in back east is not good at all. <laughs> uh, thank you for an amazing uh, presentation. Uh, the topic is really interesting. Uh, I think you're doing it right here. Um, I, uh, pardon? Absolutely. Uh, as Michael said, maybe not tomorrow, but um, certainly, uh, no, absolutely. Uh, part of this, uh, I did a little radio interview that's going to be in on the San Francisco radio. I hope I didn't say anything stupid. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's a multifaceted strategy, and um, it's an important one. The issue with getting it out to the development community, there's also an issue with getting it out to uh, your residents. Uh, a lot of people don't believe the BART station is actually coming uh, until it pops its little head out of the ground. Um, and that is probably the single biggest challenge that uh, redevelopment agencies, other towns and developers uh, have in this development environment, um, people, you know, they're not paying attention. Um, and, the way, well, and the way you, you get people to pay attention, I think, is, is a strong branding strategy. I think that's what Boston is doing right now. And Boston is where we're trying to redefine ourselves as this innovation city with the Seaport District being the center. We had a lot of innovation there, but I mean, can't rival Silicon Valley by any means, and we've got a small, you know, good share of that here already. Um, and so I think a, a very strong uh, campaign and you know hire hire a very good uh, marketing and branding firm and just define yourself how you want to be defined and get the message out. That would be, I think, the first step. Just another, uh, care, oh, sorry, just another comment too. I think that the, one of the the values of the public-private uh, partnership that we talked about is. Uh, by being led by a, uh, an experienced private developer is going to know the other people in the community, is going to be able to interest them, talk their language about the opportunity here, so reach out. I think ULI provides a great uh, forum, your local district council, to get this opportunity in, in front of the Bay Area developers. And I think, as it's been said here, uh, I couldn't field a team like you have here in Fremont in Minneapolis. The staff, the private owners that have shown an interest here, uh, the leadership at the council, it's tremendous. It's a huge asset. So when you show up to talk to developers, you got light in your eyes. They're going to be interested in that. We're looking for places that want good development and, uh, and yet hold you to high standards. So I think it is a multi-tier uh, multi strategy. But again, that, that experienced private developer leading a public-private partnership would help you communicate, uh, sort through the, the proposals, and bring folks to the site. And then and the last comment real quickly, uh, on touching on what Steven said about marketing and branding. Uh, for what it's worth, I think our entire team really liked the Rethink campaign. Um, I think that, you know, we've, we've all seen a lot of, <laughs> a lot of, uh, you know, civic boosterism and, 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 and branding strategies across the country, and that really, I feel, hit the nail on the head for what we're trying to do here, so. And not to single her out in the audience, but Karen Alshuler, uh Longtime member of the ULI San Francisco Bay Area is here. Um, ULI San Francisco is a great opportunity to get the word out to developers. Um, she's actually going to stand up, and I didn't even <laughs> ask her to. <laughs> I, I just want to say to me, not only Bay Area, but 
been involved, uh, not only been involved in ELI, those kinds of things, but we've been involved in the earlier planning as work as well for this area. And I would just want to thank you, appreciate the contribution you've made to kind of taking some of those foundation ideas and bringing them alive for what the place could be. And so it's great to see things moving forward. And uh, I'm also particularly um, encouraged that you as a national panel saw the value of keeping a jobs focused um, transfer and development happening here that we saw that, that could work because we think that's it's something actually new in the Bay Area and um, I think a different way of seeing the, the, the value, experience and value of investing in art. And so to see that balance still stay there, that's very encouraging and then to see it further come along. So thank you all very much. Thank you, Victor. Well, thank, thank you very much, Karen. It's a pleasure and actually a surprise to see you. She wasn't a plant. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I just had a question. You know, a big part of the branding strategy for is, is it has to have substance. So I'm wondering, you know, this has been a three-day exercise, and the design elements are going to be a very big part of our ability to brand it to developers, is that they can see one a further refined design of what these would look like, as well as some form of implementation metric, a matrix that would tell people, here's the phasing uh, that we would see taking place. How would we get there? What would be the most economical way, other than hiring all of you to come back and do this? That, that's pretty economical, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. But uh, I, we'd have to check with Tom. I think there might be some restrictions on us coming back in a year. I, I think it's very significant. I think you got a whole head of steam up right now. The thing to do is to strike while the iron is hot. Before you know it, the BART station's going to be up and running and people are going to be actually passing through your community. Uh, another thing that you could consider is temporary stuff, you know? I mean, before you have a pedestrian bridge, set some flagpoles out there, have a farmer's market, do a this, do a that, put, put the site on the map right away. It's the end of the line for a while. People will be coming from San Francisco, they'll be stopping, they didn't get a chance to get, you know, their dinner for the night or whatever, and farmers sitting there, you know, with stuff, can they'll I just, stop. I, here's a, just a suggestion, a, an example that uh, thinking about what can be done in a kind of a viral way. You know, while there's construction going on, there's going to be construction workers there, and otherwise people be driving by and say, oh, it's dusty. Well, just across the street, we, we almost got run over going last night, but <laughs> one of the Indian restaurants that's right behind McDonald's, they have a mobile vehicle where they serve, from which they sell Indian food. So the fact that there's a, a mobile vendor that's very close in the neighborhood and also has a brick and mortar location that was very busy last night, if you reach out to the small businesses that already have clientele, that already have employees, um, and start giving have them be part of the story, um, you start actually start to reach a lot of that um, not traditional retail communication, not traditional brand identi uh, identified market segments, and you start and just repeat that. I mean, you couple that with the fact that Tesla's delivering their first vehicles next week. I mean, those kinds of things, it's already happening here. We just have to start with each one of those. And I think that's why Michael suggested having someone who's dedicated to the task to be able to explain the whole big story with those little quick moves. There are lots of them. Yeah, and, okay. and so some of that is, is about staging, but some of it is regulatory as well. Um, another example from Boston, um, they're relaxing the, the regulations on food trucks to allow them to be more flexible around the city. Um, which they couldn't do before. Um, and then just as a, as a sort of a, a word of, uh, of lessons learned from the process they're going through now, uh, one of the issues that the food trucks want is they want to be able to group together in two and three and four because that's what gets the crowd, but right now the regulation doesn't allow that. So it's about sort of looking at, talking to them, see what they want, what they need, and then setting the stage um, politically and also physically to let them out. I'm going to just respond to that a little more for the larger development point of view. And again, that's really why I'm suggesting that we pull together a public partnership. Because really, we, we provide, you have a great site, a lot of amenities, we have some concepts here that have been developed. To really dial those down to actually create that framework plan, begin to look at the staging of the infrastructure, the staging of development. Those are really all development disciplines, understanding how to approach the market, who ought to do it, when it ought to be done. So I think that work is really the first leg of the work of any development project and really the first chunk of work for this public-private partnership to really dial down now and take these, these big numbers and big concepts and much more carefully bring them to the ground and then develop marketing materials that, uh, that reflect that 
uh, and know that when you go out into the market that the community is prepared to make the investment, that the regulations that are required. We've been in many of these things where communities go, that's exactly what we want, only to find out that's not allowed in the town we're in. <laughs> so check your regulations. Are they ready? Are you ready for developers? Are you ready to make this vision happen? So it's both some homework to be done, start that public-private partnership, uh, and develop the kind of materials that developers do to, to promote these things. And the, the one last thing I'd like to say, I'm sorry, Bill. Um, <clears throat> uh, obviously a big piece of this is is reaching out to developer communities and, and the end users, but one, one thing I, I do want to point out is that a, a major change in thinking um, in the last 10 years is the idea that talent it drives decision making on the parts of employers and ultimately developers. Uh, and the talent here has to be reached by other means than, say, an advertisement in, in, in urban land, as much as I, I think that's, that's critical here. Um, and, and that speaks to, to some of what Stephen was saying about viral marketing and, and, and guerrilla marketing. You got to remember, who, who are these people who are working uh, for, for the real big employers, uh, the growing employers in the Bay Area? And, and they're young. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and they need to be approached through different means and with different sorts of messaging. Um, and, and I think, you know, that, that sort of guerrilla marketing has to be a part of strategy as well. Because in the end, those are the ones whose mindsets about Fremont are really going to drive, um, you know, employer decision making. You know, whether they think they could attract that young 20-something um, uh, with a laptop, uh, attract that sort of person to Fremont. Yes, sir. If you're staying included on Friday, I'm sure our Chamber of Commerce would love you to see our food truck uh, party that they put on every Friday. It, it, it works really well. I thank you. A lot of information to digest. This is great. And I, I, I understand the public-private partnership, and I understand the branding and marketing. Which comes first? I think I'd like a couple of you to chime in to say, which would you focus on first? Does the public-private partnership come on first, they can help with the branding and marketing, or does the branding and marketing drive us towards the public-private partnership? Uh, both. Uh, it's not an either-or, but yeah, the public-private partnership, I would say, if ideally, if you could set that up quickly, that would be ideal, because you don't want to be off, you know, hiring consultants, doing all your branding and stuff, and then all of a sudden, but literally, they both should start right away. Um, You've got such a great potential here, um, and the market is ready for it. You know, the economy in some areas is on the upswing. Um, development's all about timing. Um, you know, literally, I, I mean, you know, I kind of laugh at it, but yeah, I'd come back here and do something if, if you were ready. Uh, Raj, you had a question, and I'm sorry, we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, we would have loved to have stayed a little longer, but some of us have flights to catch. I understand the freeways are in a horrendous shape today. My question was, uh, could you comment about financing methods for the initial public improvements, the 55 million? How, what are some of the methods or things you'd recommend? Um, we, again, didn't have enough time to study fully everything that's available, uh, but it would basically be some kind of uh, city bonding uh, against the future stream of revenues. Um, and again, or impact fees, or... Uh, yeah, we had a list of things we're going to put in the report. Yeah, we do, actually. I, I apologize. We did get a very extensive list from... Uh, the city, we just didn't have time to integrate it into our thinking over the past two, three days. But that essentially is the concept. You bond against future revenues. So you'll be sending us a written report as well? There will be a written report that is delivered to the city. Yes, that's correct. Do we have a schedule on that? or? Yeah, 30 days usually is what it takes to get the draft, and then um, usually uh, about uh, 45 to 60 days after the draft is well, once again, on behalf of the Urban Land Institute, I want to thank you very much for your kind invitation and for your kind hus hospitality. It really has been a pleasure uh, for all of us here on the panel. It's been a lot of fun, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, so thank you.